Let's talk about fatigue. Fatigue is a phenomenon where we exert a force as a function of time or a function of something else, but a time varying force on some part. And it could be uh, some type of axial load, some type of bending load, some type of torsional load. Any variations over time are going to cause crack growth, and that's actually going to pr promote premature failure in parts that would otherwise be able to withstand these loads in a static case. So usually we start with some sort of crack initiation. This can start by simply the existence of a, a tiny little micro crack because of the way a part was fabricated or because of the way the part or the material is arranged or we might, you know, knock into something or, or scratch the part or something. It, at any rate, at some point we need to initiate a crack and give a site for this crack to start to grow. And as our load varies over time, that crack is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger with each cycle. And eventually, that will run away to a sudden, brittle-style fracture, even in ductile materials. So something like aluminum might fail suddenly with no warning, where we usually see in a ductile material such as that a lot of deformation before failure. With fatigue, that's not the case. So ductile materials will go through this entire process from crack initiation to crack propagation and to sudden fracture. But brittle materials will skip straight over to sudden fracture. They have some critical point at which the crack is either big enough to break the part or it's not. And because of localized yielding limitations in brittle materials, we don't see that crack propagation phase. So for brittle materials, what we can do is control the size of the cracks that are in the material or the size of what will approximate with cracks, whether that's holes or, or tiny stress concentrations. And we can actually prevent this kind of failure in brittle materials. In ductile materials, we need to go through a pretty specific design process. Here is an example of a part that had some slow crack growth, this dark area here where this, this is a pedal crank arm from a bicycle, where this was pedaled and, and loads were exerted on it, and this crack grew slowly over time. And it was tiny and internal. And eventually, we can see here there was a a failure initiated up here at this point and you can see the waves and this fails like a brittle fracture a sudden brittle fracture where you have a stress wave blowing through the material and so it reached a critical point where this dark material was no longer supporting any load and so it came to a point where it was overloaded and the whole part broke suddenly so we have a couple of different ways of modeling this. The model that we are going to deal with the most is called the SN approach or the stress life approach. This is the easiest life or this is the easiest approach to take because there are some very simple mathematical models involved. We can do a lot from kind of first principle uh, concepts to project the life of a part over a series of loadings. This allows us to design for infinite life it, it, with certain materials, things like Certain steels, titanium, etc., have a point at which fatigue isn't going to be the mode of failure. And the modus operandi is general to, generally to prevent crack initiation with some strength criterion. We're going to design to keep the loads that are exerted on that part below a given value that makes it so that we won't get that crack growth at all. Now, this is the least accurate method for low cycle fatigue. It, it really can't describe low cycle fatigue, and so we won't really use it for low cycle fatigue. And it doesn't do anything to describe crack growth. We're trying to prevent crack growth with it. And so we base all of this on the fully reverse bending tests and some other data that we have. But for the most part, we're going to use loads that are approximated by some sinusoidal load over time that's pretty predictable. There are two other approaches, the strain life and then the LEFM approach. Uh, the strain life approach is strain based. It's accurate to look at materials from a crack initiation and damage standpoint. It's good for low cycle fatigue because you're actually talking about how that crack grows over time. This requires a computational model that's pretty accurate and it's a very complicated approach. So we only do it in specific instances where we are very interested in the growth of that crack over time. And this allows us to integrate the damage done to a piece of material over time with perhaps really unpredictable loads. The LEFM approach is similar in that it describes crack propagation. It describes the way that that crack grows. And we can use it to predict the remaining life in a part with non-destructive testing.
and we model based on existing cracks. But those models are very sensitive to the accuracy of stress intensity factors and the accuracy of the material data that you're using. So in a lot of the cases where you're using these two strain based approaches, you are really focused on a specific piece that you've got quite a bit of good data for. So a lot of the design we're going to be using has general data. We're going to be using kind of book data, published data, etc. So we are generally going to stick to the stress life approach. So what we have is we have a stress over time. And in general, we do these tests based on what's called the RR Moore bending test, which gives us a fully reversed fatigue test. So the stress is bouncing between some positive and some negative value. You can envision a part that is being spun and there's a bending moment on it and as it spins it goes from a positive bending moment to a negative, or I'm sorry, a positive bending stress to a negative bending stress. So the tensile stress versus the compressive stress over time and that varies. Now we get a different type of life if we have some mean stress where this is pushed down all into the compressive region and we do this a lot with bridges by using pretensile screws to keep the bottom of the bridge in in compression and so we we tension up those screws we tighten up those screws and that keeps the concrete from going into a tensile region where it's not as strong this can help prevent crack growth and does so in kind of an unpredictable manner for most kind of ductile materials but We'll discuss that in a different slideshow where we talk about the implications of these different scenarios. There's a third scenario called what we call repeated loading. So uh, something like a bicycle pedal where you push on it and then you're not pushing on it. And then you push on it and then you're not pushing on it. And so here we have a positive mean stress. The average stress that's exerted on the part is positive. So at really no point do we have a point where the crack is not stressed and open and so this is actual actually promoting crack growth which we don't want and then we've got the general case where we've got just some mean stress that's regularly fluctuating between two values so in general we're going to address this like a sine wave we're going to have some sigma max some sigma min and some mean which is the arithmetical mean of the two so it's the mean component sigma m we're also going to deal with delta sigma, the overall stress wave width, and the alternating component, sigma A, which is equal to the amplitude of the sine wave, or delta sigma over 2. So the components that we're really going to use for the most part are sigma max, sigma min, sigma mean, and the alternating component. So as we have a time varying stress on our part, the question is, how much stress can I put on the part for a given number of cycles. What's that behavior like? And logically we would think, well, okay, the, the larger number of cycles I want, the lower the stress must be because higher stresses are going to propagate those cracks faster, etc. And that's the behavior that we see. Now generally, it looks like what you see here on the graph. And in this graph, we have plotted the alternating stress. So from a fully reverse bending test where we have the same positive, negative, positive, negative behavior on both sides of that, that stress axis, where we've got this regularly fluctuating stress, we get this kind of behavior. So we're going to plot sigma A over here, the alternating stress on the y-axis. We're going to plot it on a logarithmic scale, or you can just plot log of sigma A on a Cartesian scale. It's the same thing. And on the y-axis, we have plotted the logarithm of the number of cycles to failure. And so we've run a bunch of tests, and what we find is that we, the data generally follows kind of these patterns. Notice for a moment that this scale starts at 10 to the third, and here is a point of interest at 10 to the 6th cycles. So at 1,000 cycles or below, we're going to call that low cycle fatigue. The models that we're talking about here, the stress life model, remember, we can't really do much to model low cycle fatigue with it because that takes into account yielding and really large cracks, etc. We're talking about small amounts of crack growth over a large number of cycles. And so we start at 10 to the 3rd, go to 10 to the 6th what we see is this line in, of course, log log, which would translate to something like a hyperbolic uh, curve. And we have a point at 10 to the third that is a function of simply the ultimate tensile strength and the type of loading we're putting on the part. Now, in bending, we are only stressing the outer edges of the part. So internal cracks really don't grow all that much I at first. They don't in initially grow because they don't get stressed. So the amount of material being stressed is a determining factor 
in this strength here at 10 to the third cycles as well as the ultimate tensile strength of the material. So if we're doing bending, as we are in our more bending test, then it's 0.9 times the ultimate tensile strength. If we are axially loading it, then all of that cross-sectional area is being loaded. And so you have a lot more probability that you're going to get some crack growth. So this in tests has been about 75% of the ultimate tensile strength instead of 90% of the ultimate tensile strength. Now down here at 10 to the 6, now this, this behavior, let's talk about that for a moment. Here we see a knee, what we generally refer to as a knee, and this is what we call an endurance limit. At about a million cycles, for a number of steels and titanium and some other specific materials, we get this behavior where if it gets to about a million or so cycles, a million, somewhere between a million and 10 million, it's going to last for orders of magnitude longer than that in terms of number of cycles to failure, long enough that we generally won't even get failure in the test. And so this is a function of a lot of factors. We'll talk about that here in a bit. But for some materials, we get this knee, and it generally occurs around a million cycles. Now, some materials, such as aluminum, uh, derivatives of copper like brass, bronze, etc., don't have that knee. They simply start here at SM, the same SM. The SM is just a function of the loading type, not a function of the material other than the ultimate tensile strength. So they go from SM, and we're going to define some point at 5 times 10 to the 8 cycles. That doesn't mean we always design for 5 times 10 to the 8 cycles. It's just a common point that we say, okay, we're going to define at 5 times 10 to the 8 cycles a point. That gives us enough width to get a good line of fit, because this is, again, noisy data. We get a good fit, and we can define this strength as some fatigue limit SF prime, as a, opposed to the endurance limit SE prime from steels and titaniums from the previous slide. And we can draw then this line, this failure line that comes down here, and tells us this behavior between the alternating stress and the number of cycles to failure. Then the process, whether we're using steels with an endurance limit or aluminums or coppers or whatever, what we want to do is say, well, I've got some life that I'm interested in, and I'm going to draw up here after I've determined what the equation of this line is, and then I can come over here and determine what sigma A should be, the alternating stress for that number of cycles to failure. Now for the theoretical fatigue and endurance strength values, we have a number of different equations. For typical materials, the theoretical endurance and fatigue strengths are roughly half of the ultimate tensile strength. But it really is material dependent. It's dependent on the strength of that material, the actual behavior. Because remember, some steels are extremely brittle compared to other steels. Some steels are quite ductile. Some aluminums are not ductile in the sense that their ultimate tensile strengths and their yield strengths are very, very close. Some others are quite different. So in general, though, the behavior we're going to see is that steels with uh, an, an ultimate tensile strength less than 200 KSI are going to have an endurance strength, or we'll, we'll say an uncorrected endurance strength, of about half of the ultimate tensile strength. Aluminums of typical strengths, so things like 6061, T6 aluminum, will have an ultimate tensile strength less than 48 KSI, and will have a fatigue limit of roughly 40% of that ultimate tensile strength. What you'll see in general is that the higher strength materials, if they go, for example, steels above 200 KSI ultimate tensile strength, they will cap off, they, they won't have an endurance limit any greater than about 100 KSI. And so you just need to look through and see what the data says for the given material that you're using. So the problem is we run these tests, these are our more bending tests, on really nice, pretty, shiny test specimens that are extremely consistent and we've done a lot of testing so we have a really good idea of what the ultimate tensile strength is, this, that, and the other. And again, the data is noisy, but Let's say we run our RR more bending tests and we get this general curve for 6061 aluminum. Well, in practice, if I'm designing a part, it's not going to be that exact set of circumstances. I'm going to be approximating this with a von Mises stress. The behavior of the material isn't going to be a perfect analog. We've got a lot of different factors that need to be taken into account to get what's a more accurate stress life idea. So what we do is we start off with SM. That is a pretty good approximation because we're not really talking about too much crack growth at 1,000 cycles. And so that remains what it was before, simply a function of the ultimate tensile strength and the type of loading we're putting on it. Now, 
instead of SE prime, what we're really looking for is SE, or what's called the corrected endurance limit. So we have this SE prime from the previous slide that was about 40 to 50 percent of the ultimate tensile strength of the material, depending on the situation, depending on the material. And what we're going to do is put a set of correction factors on this, one for the type of load, one for the size of the specimen, one for the surface, one for the temperature we're operating at, and one for the reliability that we're interested in for our part. And all of these are going to be one or less, and they are all going to multiply together to give us some reduction factor for this endurance limit. And that gives us a new line. If this is a steel down here, if it was an aluminum, it would be the same line for aluminum or bronze or whatever that would not have that knee. The same is true. So instead of the endurance limit with these correction factors, we would have the fatigue limit with these correction factors, and we would have, have SF and uncorrected. So the general procedure is thus. We're going to select a material or a number of materials to compare. We need to calculate SM, again, a function of the ultimate tensile strength of that material and the type of loading we're going to be putting on it. We need to calculate SE prime or SF prime if it's not a steel with an endurance limit, which gives us the second defined point. Again, this doesn't mean we're always going to define, uh, we're go always going to design for infinite life or design for 5 times 10 to the 8 cycles. It's not the case. This simply gives us two points on a line so we can design for an appropriate number of cycles to failure. We don't want to have a lot of over-design, but what we do want is something that has an appropriate life assessed, uh, uh, attributed to it. We're then going to calculate our correction factors, correction factors for size, the type of loading, the surface finish, the temperature, and the reliability. These are ones that have been generally offered as acceptable for all around design, you may find that you need to generate your own correction factor for some other variables that we're not taking into account here. That's fine. But for a kind of a generalized approach at design without knowing a lot more about given applications that, that you're going to be using this in, these ones suffice pretty well, especially after we apply a factor of safety. So we're then going to calculate our corrected SE or SF, our corrected endurance limit or fatigue limit, and draw our load line and say, okay, here is the load line. And so we've got our SN diagram. And then we can calculate our alternating stress for a desired life. So let's say this is the number of cycles I am designing for right here, less than, well, fewer than 10 to the 6 cycles. Then I'm going to come up here to the load line with my corrected factors, and then come over here and say, well, okay, the al alternating stress at that number of cycles, so the design number of cycles, is this. Then, just like I would apply a factor of safety thereafter to a simple yielding case, a simple static case, I'm going to say, well, my factor of safety is equal to the sigma A at N design divided by the sigma, sigma A that I designed the part for. So I'm going to design the part to keep a level of stress. Say in this, in this case, it looks like it's about a 3 to 1 ratio. So I'd have a factor of safety of 3 if I said, well, this is the alternating stress that is allowed according to my corrected curve then the sigma A I'm going to design for is one-third of that. That would give me a factor of safety there. Now this factor of safety, or this method for calculating factor of safety, only works for fully reversed bending. So things like rotating shafts, etc., where we've got this regular pattern of positive, negative, positive, negative, a mean stress of zero, essentially. That's fully reversed, and that's where this data comes from. Remember that if we have a mean stress that is less than that will actually get better life. And so a conservative estimate would be simply to use this approach knowing that we'll get better behavior. But if we have an elevated mean stress, a non-zero mean stress, where we're actually fluctuating up here, where there's always some positive level of stress on it, or not, not necessarily even that, but that we've got a mean stress above zero, our life is actually going to be reduced and we will calculate the factor of safety using a modified Goodman diagram. We'll go over that in a different presentation.